I thought we were very middle class. I said, you know, like the Cosby's. <laughs> like the, is that, but that's how you live. Yeah, so, you yeah, know, the Cosby home, show. Yeah. Inside. And so I, I, that was, to me, was like normal. Mance, I want to thank you for taking the time to come this morning. My pleasure. Um, let's start off with the first question. Okay. Now, I met you only once. And you've been here for, you said, 20 years? 22 you? years. 22 years? Yeah. And I met you once at a party the Dan threw. Right. Right? And that was at the Sun Hotel, I believe. Yeah. I met you then, and you had your camera with you and stuff, and you're a photographer, or you were at that time. Yeah. Where were you born? I was born in uh, Michigan. Okay. So my parents were in grad school when they had my sister and I. I have an older sister. How many years difference? Uh, a year and a half. Okay. Are you, so. your sister and parents doing okay? Yeah, everybody's good. My sister's in D.C. and my parents go back and forth between South Carolina and Ohio, depending on the season. They're from South Carolina? No, but um, once they retired, they, they bought a place down there. And okay. my dad's mother is from South Carolina. Okay. So we have some connection with, uh, with Charleston and okay. the family. All right, so, all right. um, so they go down there uh, in the winter and come back up to Ohio in the in the spring summertime. Yeah. Have you ever gone? Have you been down? There? Oh yeah. Oh, uh, Charleston's beautiful. You know, I've it's been the there yeah, it's the number one destination uh, location for weddings. Is that right? So in the US. yeah, and Hawaii is too. Okay. So that that should tell you something. Is that right? Because yeah. the because the changing of the leaves and everything. Well, or? you know, they have the kind of. Uh, old southern style mm -hmm. that you know the antebellum kind of houses and stuff a lot of people yeah, like that dresses. yeah the dresses and and the battery so yeah. and they have these great uh, oak trees with Spanish moss that grows on them so mm -hmm. it's, it's really scenic yeah. um, but you know of course there's a lot of history both good and bad down there but yeah. um, it's a very interesting place and um, during slavery times a lot of the slaves could actually hire out and they could get work passes. So they could actually leave the plantations and go work in the city. Mm -hmm. And they had permission to do that and they could make money on their own. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of black entrepreneurial uh, history in Charleston. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's very different from Virginia and, and other states. Yeah, yeah. But you know, we had big uh, slave uprisings in, in South Carolina well, also. All, I think they were everywhere, but they yeah. just, you have to look deep enough to find them because they were taken out of the worker books, yes. they, a lot of people didn't want people to know that that took place. Right. That's happened in modern history too. There were some uprisings in the military mm. during the Vietnam time. Oh, really? That they won't talk about, which I'll tell you during lunch, yeah. that actually took place that were big huh. deals. That's interesting. I didn't, yeah, so I mean, I, I, I didn't. But that's the same. Our history has been, just think about the American Indian. Right. <laughs> you think, right. we've been snuck down. Right. <laughs> they were annihilated. Right. And the history is lost, right. basically. And some some tribes are completely gone. Yeah, but that's interesting. Anyway, I don't know if I'm going to keep this in or not. Yeah, no. this <laughs> part, this, all this part out here. Get back to where, so. Where, where were you born again? You said so. I was born in Michigan. Michigan. Right? Um, my parents were in grad school when they had us, and then um, my father taught for a couple years. Mm -hmm. So we lived in Virginia, and then we ended up moving to Seattle. Um, and we lived there for uh, three years before moving to St. Louis. Who did so. your father teach? Um, I'm not actually sure. So he got his PhD in agricultural economics okay. because he wanted to study entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. but there was no um, major that had that as a, as a topic. So he found these um, farmers in Michigan who would um, have, you know, when you can go pick your own mm -hmm. fruit or pick your own corn or whatever, that's how they would make uh, money, mm -hmm. because as a farmer, they couldn't, you know, they were in the red. Mm -hmm. So they, they started these businesses where they would have just, you know, the average Joe come pick corn or whatever, and that's how they would make enough money to make it through the year. So he was <clears throat> researching that and these entrepreneurs. So that was what his major was in. So I can't imagine he was teaching agricultural economics, but what but, about your mother? She just she, uh, she was home? a M she got an MS in nutrition. Okay. Yeah, um, and then they got into business, and so most of my life, my parents were entrepreneurs. Is so, that what yeah. kind of business did they have?
<clears throat> when we lived in St. Louis, uh, they owned a company that made uh, and repaired uh, railroad cars. What? Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> wait, your mother and father started a business that repaired railroad cars. Yes. Well, how? What kind of repair? Like what? Um. So you know the the the, the cars are the the make up a train. Right. Um. They would manufacture them, okay. and sometimes there would be damage to them, so that they, they would repair those. Okay. So they had that company, um, probably f fifteen years or so. And then they got a contract uh, with the government to make these huge um, boxes, uh, containers that you could put a tank or airplane wing in and you could stack them on top of each other and they had a hydraulic floor. And that was a contract that, that the Navy was buying these containers. Mm -hmm. So they did that and then um, my dad kind of saw that that business was um, kind of railroad industry was gonna go down. Mm -hmm. So he got into uh, automotive. So they bought a company in Ohio that made um, car parts. So automotive stamping. But how old were you when your father had the first car? Did you remember, were you a little boy or were you? Yeah, so uh, yeah. we moved to St. Louis in 81. So how uh, old were you? I was in first grade. First grade, okay. Yeah, so, you know, I grew up with them running that company and we used to go the company was actually in on the edge of East St. Louis in Allerton, so mm -hmm. Illinois, mm -hmm. so across the river. Um, so we used to drive through East St. Louis all the time, and you know. How many people were employed in this company? Do you know? I don't know. Several hundred. Okay. Um, so when you came in, they knew you were the boss's son. Yes. <laughs> yes. So you were very affluent as a little kid. Um. You know, it's funny. I always joke with people. I I thought we were very middle class. I said, you know, like the Cosby's. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, but that's how you live. Yeah, so, you yeah, know, the Cosby show. And yeah. Inside. And so I, I, that was, to me, was like normal. But, um, yeah, it would be, of course. That's all uh, you But, you know, so I ended up going to a school in Clayton, which was in the county. Mm -hmm. And that's where, um, after the, um, the trouble in Ferguson happened, that was where that trial was. It was near my high school. And I was living in the city. So we were actually in the voluntary desegregation program. So we were bused to school. So I, I rode with all the other desegregation students to school every day. But what kind of school did you go to? So it was a very rich, um, you know, suburban... Um, white school. White school <laughs> in Clayton. Wait, so the school that you came from was pretty mixed or was it? Yeah, so my, my uh, elementary school was very mixed. Okay. Um, and it's really crazy. So you remember the family that um, the, the people were protesting and the family, the, the wife and husband came out and pointed their guns at them? No. Before, okay. But that was... So this was uh, two summers ago. All right, well, yeah, two summers ago. You mean, you, you're talking about from now? Yeah. Remember, so... I don't watch the news. So oh, okay, so, so after... I don't. I don't. <laughs> after the shooting of, uh, well, the killing of, of um, Mr. Floyd, I George know, Floyd. I know that, yes. So there were protests all over America. Okay. And in St. Louis, these people were protesting um, along a, a private street. Mm -hmm. And these two people pulled out guns. I might have heard of that. Okay. okay. That was literally the street across the main street and diagonally from my from where I grew up. You grew up there. Yeah. So this was like, and it was literally two, three minutes from my elementary school is where mm -hmm. all this happened. So it was just so bizarre um, to see that. But you know, St. Louis is a very segregated city. What city in the states is it? But St. Louis is like the deep south. So there's a street right. called Delmar, east and west. North of that is 99% black, and there's a street called uh, Grand. Mm -hmm. And south of that is South St. Louis. It's, it's again, 90-something percent white. So, I mean, where I grew up was very mixed, but, you know, just two miles north of that was, like, all black. And a few miles south of that was basically all white. All white. So you knew where you could go right. and, and where you shouldn't be right. and things like that. So, so you knew that from a little kid. Your parents yeah. would basically let you know. Yeah. And your if they didn't, your friends would. You right. knew where you could and couldn't go. But, you know, I didn't really feel like racism um it's funny though in, in high school i was playing soccer and we were playing a, a team from the the kind of county so it was very you know uh rural white 
you know, black people. And I stole the ball from this kid, and he was like, nice play. No, he didn't. And, we're, and I, was, I just, like, saw red. And, and I, did you do? I started chasing the guy. And I was cussing, and, 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 and so, of course, you know, the referee blows the whistle. The, my coach takes me out and had me sit down for a few minutes. I was so livid. You caught him, I'm sure. I never, I wasn't able to do anything, but, you but know. But you did catch him. Well, I mean, he knew he messed up because I saw it in his eyes. His eyes got, you know, like this. And, and he, he said what he was thinking. He yeah, said, he was running. He said, was that my inside talk or my outside talk? <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I, I couldn't believe it, you know. I was just Isn't like. That funny? That was the straw. The nerve. <laughs> the straw. He <laughs> the wrong straw. <laughs> but, you know, St. Louis was a, a, a very good city to grow up in. We were right near Forest Park. I didn't really feel... Um, you know, when I think now, what, like what a child needs to develop and, and live their best life, you know, a sense of safety and protection and being loved. And, and that was all there in abundance. And we had great neighbors. Um, one of the women who lived down the street from us, uh, Frankie Freeman, she was a civil rights attorney and she worked under Johnson. So she helped get a lot of legislation passed. And she used to have these parties at her house and she would have people from like Yemen and all over the world, and it was it was Is that very. That was your first taste of really international mixing. Yeah, yeah. it was really, and she was kind of like a a, a, a a grandmother figure. I mean, she you know she helped mentor my parents, so and you know there were a lot of people Is she still like around? that. No, she passed away, um, and she was pretty old when she passed yeah. away. And um, there's a book about her as well. Right. So, um, and her husband was a photographer. So, is that what you? But I, I, I started um, getting interested in photography in uh, high school. Okay. There was a, um, a photography uh, professor, teacher at our school, who was black. Okay. And I took his Wait, some, class. Most your teachers weren't black. No, no. He was one of the few black teachers at well, my high school. Well, you could count them on one hand. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You could count them. On, on on two fingers or so. <laughs> wait, wait man, wait. So wait, I want to go back a little bit. So elementary school, what was your elementary school like? The person you can remember, what was it like? I had a great elementary school. Um, it was mixed and the teachers were all very, um, so it was a private school um, and the teachers were very um, caring and real interesting. One, um, she, she made these stories and she would read us these stories. And um, it's interesting. So uh, there, were, there were a group of us who would, would uh, draw in, uh, in recess or you know, when we had free time. And of that group, um, two are artists. I'm a photographer. And one guy's a, a outdoor. He does outdoor stuff. As a result of it, yeah. it just happened to be. You guys, just were, you guys to be. were very creative anyway. Right. And you're doing things in your adult life that were very creative. Yeah, so I mean, it, you, you see how things really hit you at a young age. And, and they, you don't they think were about it. But you were being nurtured in the areas that you liked anyway. Right. You weren't being told, no, stop that and do your math. Right. Okay. Right. So, so I had a great um, ele elementary school. And it was like a five minute walk from our house. So we would walk to school. So we lived on the corner uh, of a street. And there was a major uh, thoroughfare. Uh, right there and two lanes going each way and so I would I would walk to school crossing that street from elementary school so you know if there weren't any cars coming I would go against the light <laughs> allegedly <laughs> but you know so so that experience of you know walking to school were you close with your sister yeah so she's just two years old yeah so right? so we would walk together to school are you um, still close with your sister yeah so um, she has two kids now so you're an uncle I'm an uncle and uh, the my, How old are your kids? How old are your uh, kids? my nephew just turned uh, fifteen. Fifteen. Wow. Let me let me say that again. My nephew just turned fourteen. <laughs> I, I say it both ways and, and make just sure which one's. <laughs> Wait, I'm gonna let you hear this whole thing right here. No, you're gonna get you're gonna get the you're gonna get to hear your uncle not know if you're fourteen or fifteen. I'm not taking this out. <laughs> No, no. Go on. I'm pretty sure he's 15. Right. And well, say hello to you. Don't forget, that's your camera. Say hello <laughs> to your family if you want to. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so, um, and my niece is uh, 13. Okay. Or 12. All right. I so, think she's 12. So, there's, she, she did the same space in the gym. Yeah, same. Room. And my, my dad and my aunt are the same. 
Okay. Um, pretty much. So it's it's pretty interesting. Okay. And it's just the oh, two of them. Oh, he had a sister. He had a sister. He what has an older mother? sister. What about your mother? She had uh, so let's see, Carol, Charles, Carl, oh, uh, Kathy, <laughs> Cindy. So it's five. Right. And they all and my grandmother and grandfather, uh, Cosby and Carrie. So everybody's a C. Are you kidding me? Really? <laughs> yeah. Look, wait. So your mother, where's she ranked among her siblings? Uh, she's the third. I want to. So say. she's in the middle. Or no, maybe no. She's the fourth. Okay. Yeah. So um, no, no, no. So she has an older brother, older sister, her, a younger brother, and a younger sister. So, so she's, she's the middle. middle in yeah, the middle. exactly in the middle. Yeah. And your father is he the oldest or the youngest? He's the youngest, sister? and yeah. I'm the youngest. So um, he knows. So you guys both know that. What is oh, like yeah. They have an older sister. Oh yeah. But my 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 <laughs> nephew is older than my niece though. So that's the only. So it's the only your one. Sister, your sister broke the tie. <laughs> she broke it. <laughs> she broke the tie. <laughs> And you you can you contact your family often? Oh yeah, you know I think especially during COVID, um, you know when you had downtime, we would just uh, and and also because things are a lot cheaper these days, mm -hmm. or it's free basically. Yeah. Tell me, so, I was just talking to my mother this morning. Yeah, let me ask you this, man. When did they finally feel like you're not coming back? Because I'm sure they tried to pull you back, didn't they, for the first yeah ten years? <laughs> well, I think my parents knew. Um, from an from an early age that I was really interested in Asia okay. um, and when I was in high school um, well let me backtrack so when I was uh, in 1980 I saw Shogun the the um, the miniseries with uh, uh, Toshiro Mifune and Shimada Yoko um, or Yoko Shimada rather and um, it was the you know the the, the real thick novel, mm -hmm. um, and it after the Thorn Birds it was the next big miniseries and it was a huge hit. It, it had the highest um, viewership, and as a result of that, all these you know sushi restaurants and tempura restaurants and all these Japanese things started becoming very popular all around America. And um, there was a scene in this drama where these ninja come out and attack. There's a night attack on the castle. And I was just blown away. And I said, well, what, what is this? And I was like, oh, these ninjas, they're so cool. I was like, this is what I want to be. Isn't that interesting? How old were you at this time? <laughs> so I was seven. And that's when you knew. Yeah. So I saw these ninja and it just blew my mind. And I was like, this is what I want to do. And then um, there were a lot of movies in the 80s uh, with this guy named, this actor named Sho Kosugi, who's from Nagoya. His son is a really big actor here called Ken Kosugi. But he did all these ninja movies, low budget, really bad ninja movies in America in the 80s. So the whole 80s, I was like just enthralled with ninja. So, you know, martial art magazine, you know, most kids and s most guys in school were reading, you know, car magazines or something. Mm -hmm. I was reading martial art magazines. So I was really into martial arts, and I used to make my mom take me to South St. Louis, which was like the white section. There was a little um, uh, Chinese-run uh, Asian martial arts shop. So they, they had antiques and incense and you know nunchucks and all kind of stuff, but they also had the ninja books and, and weapons and things. So I used to, whenever I would save up enough money, I would ask my mom to take me, and, and we'd go down there. So. So my, you know, uh, young formative years, there were a lot of influences like that. Um, and some more subtle, like, you know, we used to watch uh, Speed Racer and Battle of the Planets, all these Japanese anime, but not really kind of piecing together that they were Japanese. But, you know, I watched all kind of, you know, samurai films and, and kung fu films. And so I, I always had this interest in Asia, but it was kind of very, uh, Immature. I didn't know, you know, what was what and what came from where, um, but that was something that just fascinated me. So. So you, but your parents picked up on that right away. Yes, and my my mom, she went back and got an MBA when I was in uh, elementary school, mm -hmm. and their graduation trip was a trip to China and Japan. So they they went to Japan. With your mother and father. My parents. Okay. And, and left you guys back at home. Left us at home, right. and I never let them forget it. <laughs> I was so. <laughs> I was so. How old were you this time? I was probably like ten or something. And you just. I said, was so said, Why hurt. Why did I get these kind of parents? I was <laughs> like, Why didn't you take me? 
And I had, I, I had one request. I wanted my dad to get me a ninja outfit. And he went all over Japan looking for one. He finally found one and he bought it for me. And when I got it, I looked at it and said, mm, this isn't authentic. <laughs> you did not. Did you really? And to this day, he always brings that up. He really? said, you had me. All he went through to get this thing. And you look at it, it's not authentic. <laughs> isn't that something? Yeah. Was your sister as much involved in the Asian? No. Was her, she what, was had, her, what was her interest? Um, just out of curiosity. You know, just normal things, you know. Um, she uh, she started running track, and then I started running track after her. So see, but she was super bad because your group beat out everybody else. That that four four one hundred. Yeah, yeah. You guys killed. Them. <laughs> you yeah. had to hold the trophy up there on the top, <laughs> and you had everybody standing beside you like this. <laughs> <laughs> All those other teams. Well, that's a funny story because so that was my freshman yeah. year. So I was went, it? I went to state freshman year. Well, you must have been anchor. Uh, I was the, I was the lead. Oh, you the yeah, lead. I was the but lead. You been such a gap. <laughs> yeah, but um, the team that should have won is actually it was a school called Berkeley, and they were our rivals, uh, and they're actually in Ferguson, so where the Michael Brown incident was. That's where that school is, and uh, they dropped the baton, oh. and we were like, "Thank you, thank, thank you, thank you very much." <laughs> But um, I was a hurdler. What school was what school was that? I, I went to Clayton High. But whose school was that meet at? Oh, that was at State, at uh, oh, Jeff, State. Jeff City. Oh, Jeff City. Uh, and at the yeah. State Capitol. It was uh, packed up, everybody went yeah. nuts. So, um, so, yeah, so I ran track. Uh, I is, that, is that the only thing you did was f the, four, the relay? No, 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 I was you a hurdler. I thought yeah. I was going to think Yeah, that. so I was a state champ. I was actually national champ. Uh, Junior Olympics when I was 16. But what got you into track and field? Well, you, you were headed towards art in elementary school. Then you get into junior high school. What happened there? Um, I don't know how we got in. Well, my parents used to run many marathons. So they used to, you know, run. So they were always um, But then they, they used to take us and we would bike ride and things. But then somehow we got into it. I think they just wanted us to do something in the summer so we wouldn't just be at home. So we started running track, and then my sister was really good, and then I found the hurdles, and I fell in love with them, because it's so much fun, because the jumping, and, and um, so I really got into the hurdles. So I did that through college, so maybe 13 years I ran track. Mm -hmm. um, so I did, you know, I played basketball in the, in the winter, mm -hmm. and then I would play um, Soccer in the fall mm -hmm. and ran ran track in the spring. But track and was summer. your favorite. Yeah. Oh yeah. Track was fun. So when you went to college, what did you major in? Asian studies. <laughs> <laughs> From the get go. No. So it's funny. It's yeah. <laughs> so I started off at University of Michigan. Right. I was there a year, and it was too big and too cold. And I came back home and went to University of Missouri for a semester. And then my best friend from high school was at Pomona College. And he's like, you should come to Pitzer. And I was like, what's that? And so I went to visit and I fell in love. I mean, California, you know, you got the ocean, you got the mountains, the beautiful women, the weather, and I just loved it. And, mm -hmm. um, but I never declared my major. I could have done international studies. I could have done Spanish and I ended up doing Asian studies. So I had some options, but I was actually, I declared a year after I was supposed to. Mm -hmm. But, um, so yeah, so um, I studied, my, my university, they made us do China and Japan, China and Korea, China, or China and Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't just do Japan, yeah, right. but. Um, Is that what you wanted to do, just Japan? Just Japan was my interest, but, mm -hmm. but through my, program, you know, I got to study, you know, a lot of different Asian religions and culture, history, art. Um, I even took a Japanese, like, econ class. So it's it kind of very um, multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing was, I never had, like, a plan. Like, okay, this is my life's goal, and I'm going to do this, this, this. Yes, and yes, get. No, yeah. So I had no idea, because Asian studies isn't a very useful major. 
you can yeah. either go yeah. to grad school and teach right, right. or even be a consultant or something. But with just an undergrad degree in Asian studies, it, it doesn't do much. <laughs> and I, I had no like thought of that. And it's just what I love. So I, I just. So how'd you get here? So um, well, I, I mean, actually. Was it, when you came here, was it, had you come here during college time? Yeah. Or? So I actually came here um, my, the summer of my sophomore year in college. I, um, I asked my professors, because we didn't have any study abroad at our, our college, but um, I asked my professors if you know, they knew any good programs. And one of my professors was, was friends of a professor who had a program through uh, University of Kansas, uh, Topeka, Kansas. And their sister city was um, Hiratsuka in Kanagawa. So the University of Kansas and um, Kanagawa Daigaku are sister colleges. So I, I went on that program. So my sophomore year, summer, it was a dream come true. It's my first time coming to Japan, and I, I fell in love with everything. Um, how long were you going to, how long did it you was, go It was six weeks. Six weeks, okay. And, and what were you to do during that six weeks? So we had classes at the university, okay. and then we went to Kyoto, and we stayed with, um, we stayed in this dorm and you know, hung out with students and things. I went to karaoke for the first time, and I did it twice in one day. <laughs> you like that much? It was so <laughs> much fun. So I went in the, in, the, in the daytime, and then with different friends in the evening we went. And um, I mean, it, everything was great. And you know, we studied Japanese and everything. So when I got back to college in the fall, I had enrolled in Japanese. So the first week of class, I'm like, oh, oh. And I, I knew all the answers. You knew all of them. I knew everything. So they had to do something with you. So by the second week of class, I was like, what? Like, this is like, it, all of a sudden it was a totally different language. And I was like lost. So my whole six week summer program was actually officially a week, a week's worth of Japanese. So. I actually didn't do that good in Japanese, and I ended up dropping it the next semester. And then um, my the um, s the winter vacation of my senior year. So winter vacation, senior year, I was like missing Japan, and I wanted to come back. And I was trying to figure out how can I get back. You know, I'm a student, no money. So I decided to make my thesis about um, monks' lives in the temple. And the head monk of Tofukuji Temple in Kyoto was a good friend of my professor. So I wrote to the, to the monk, and he was like, yeah, you can come train with us. So they, in the winter, they have this really intense week-long zazen practice where it's like almost nonstop meditation, and they don't sleep. And actually, it's interesting because a lot of monks actually reach satori during that time, but I think half of it is because they're just... You know, they're, they're sleep deprived and they're meditating nonstop. So we would get up at like four in the morning. They would chant for an hour and they gave me a sutra book. I mean, it's all cursive Japanese. I'm like looking at it and they would chant for an hour. So I would just hum just to stay warm. And then we would meditate for an hour, have breakfast. And then during the day I had free time and they would work and then we would meditate again at night. So I did that for four days. And what was the result of it? And think? it's weird because somehow Japanese started clicking for me. And my time, you know, in the temple you barely talk. Every time you try to say something, they shh, don't say anything. So, um, but I met this woman who was visiting the temple and she started talking to me and, and somehow I, I, I could understand. So it was really bizarre. But then I went back uh, the next semester and took Japanese. So I, I kind of had a year off from Japanese and then the last semester. So I only studied Japanese for one year in college. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I graduated, I worked for my parents. So what, what were they doing this time? Uh, so this is when they had the automotive stamping company. So okay. they had a factory in South Carolina, mm -hmm. in rural South Carolina, a place called Sumter. So I worked there in the, in the office for uh, two years. Now when you say stamping, I don't understand, what do you mean? So um, a lot of the car parts, um, there's coiled steel 
that rolls through a press and it stamps these parts so you have a, a, a big sheet of steel that gets as you stamp it it gets smaller and smaller and in the end you just have a little piece and then that's what goes in the car okay and uh, it's very loud and very you know it's, it's a fact factory um, so I work there and you know people always oh you know you're so lucky you know you're working for your family and this and they don't understand like you have such a different feeling of responsibility so you know most people nine to five at 501 the, the yeah. office is a ghost town no one's there but because it's my parents company yeah, yeah. you know one time I worked uh, 21 days straight mm. so no weekends no you know um, so I, I had a lot of stress and I was really not loving being you know I went from California to South Carolina rural South Carolina and um, you know I wanted to be back in Japan and this girl I had dated in college she uh, messaged me or called me up out of the blue and was like oh you know do you still want to live in Japan I was like yeah and she's like I think I can help you so she knew some people whose town was near our college in California and they were hiring teachers because they had a sister city in, in um, Tochigi so I actually got um, through her got an opportunity to interview in California and they said okay and so I got to teach uh, junior high English for two years Wow. So Without like, going through the JIT program. Right. Wow. It's a little better. The yeah. pay was better. And, mm -hmm. you know, I had a, um, we had these townhouses and I had a two bedroom um, living, you know, living room, mm -hmm. kitchen, huge bathroom, all to myself um, for two years. Nice. But of course, I was in rural Tochigi. So it was very, uh, you know, Inaka, very country. But um, I, I had a ball. Did you find that, did that help you to pick up Japanese quicker? So, interestingly enough, I wasn't able to study Japanese because there were no classes in my town. But um, on the weekends, I would take off. I would go all over. Like, I even did the, um, uh, the pilgrimage in Shikoku, the 88 temples, Hachiju Hakasho. Mm -hmm. I did that by mountain bike. So I would just get on the train, go to Tokyo, or, you know, do my martial arts. So I was never at home. So, you know... Just over the two years, looking at signs and reading signs and things like that, you know, you start to pick it up. Um, but my Japanese wasn't great, mm -hmm. you know, it was fair. So when did you come to Japan to be where you are now? So I moved back uh, to the States in 2000. And from 2000 to 2002, I worked for my parents again. And this time in Ohio. But I was like, okay, I don't want to lose the little Japanese I have. So I made friends with the Japanese students in town. So I would always hang out with them and speak Japanese. And so I figured the best thing was to really master Japanese was to come back. And I did a language program here at uh, Takshoku University uh, in Miyogadani. And that was just two years intense, nine to five, every day, Japanese. And that's really what kind of did it yeah was it reading and writing as well reading and writing oh, everything that's really happens, yes. yeah but the the funny yeah. thing is so when i had come to look for a program i stayed with a friend on the tobu line from ikebukuro and every day I, I saw this poster and i couldn't figure out what it was this beautiful asian woman with long hair long flowing hair and i knew it wasn't a photo i knew it wasn't a painting but i couldn't figure out what kind of art it was so finally, I went to this exhibit at Tobu department store, and there's a white guy in a suit standing there. And I'm like, oh, hi. And I walk in and, and see the exhibit, and I figured out it was cut paper. So it's uh, these paper cutouts, kirie is what the Japanese term is. And I was getting ready to leave, and he was like, you know, did you understand the work? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, well, the artist's wife is having a, a book signing. If you want, you know, she can sign your book. So I was only there for two weeks and, you know, I was on a budget. So I bought the cheapest book, but I was first in line for the book signing. And when his wife uh, greeted me, she's like, oh, hi, nice to meet you. And I told her I was coming back in six months to study Japanese. She was like, oh, then we should have tea. And she gave me her business card. So. You know, when I come back in 2002, I start to um, interact with this artist's widow, and 
you know, I would translate things for her website and she would have me come to some of the exhibits. So when I graduated from my language program, she hired me. And we had a, um, we had a, a, a tour of all the Mitsukoshi. So um, when I graduated in 2004, we had a exhibit of his art. Um, the artist's name is Miyata Masayuki. Um, and he, he was considered the number one KDA artist in Japan. So we, we had an a exhibit at Mitsukoshi um, and Nihonbashi. We went to Sapporo, Osaka, uh, Fukuoka, Sendai. So, mm -hmm. so we went all over. And before I actually started working for her when I was still a student, she had an exhibit of his work inside the Forbidden City. Mm. where the Chinese emperor's art collection was. So I actually got to go on that trip. So this was my first time. You see the Forbidden City? My first time in China. Wow. We stayed at the state guest house where they have the six party talks. And, you know, I got to see the Great Wall. And, and, and we had our, um, our reception dinner was in the, the Hall of the People. So they're Congress. So, I mean, it's just this amazing experience. And I, I, I was like, well, I don't ever need to go back to China because you're not going to top yeah, this. Yeah, <laughs> but um, so I worked for her um, for about 10 years. Is she still doing well? She passed away in oh, September. Oh, did she? Yeah. So I actually found oh, her sure. at her. Uh, she lived in Shiro Kanadai. And what I actually mean, you found her? I went over to her condo and I found her in her bed. She had already passed away, so. You're the first of the Yeah, summer. but she was like my Japanese mother and my mentor for 20 years. So she gave you? Yeah, so I had a key. You had a key and everything. Yeah, so um, I used had to drive her around. She didn't have a, a, a license, so I would drive her a Jaguar and I would chauffeur her around. How old was she when she passed? <laughs> she was 78. Oh, that's too young. Yeah. Was but she in bad shape? Was she in bad? No, she, she, a couple days before she had said she had a fever and, you know, I, I messaged her, do you know, do you want me to bring she anything? She this past September? Past September, yeah. So this was just last year? Yeah, so just a few months ago. Was it COVID? No. No, it wasn't it was COVID. COVID. Okay. Yeah, but, but we don't know what it was. They don't, they didn't say yeah, anything, just yeah. let it go and she's gone. Yeah, so, um, but it, it was, um, you know, it was a big surprise. But because of that, so these last few months, I've been helping out um, with trying to secure his legacy, you know, his artwork. There's still a lot of his artwork that the company owns. Um, and so uh, trying to deal with, you know, the dispens dispensation of her, um, you know, her apartment and all that stuff. So it's just, just a lot she of stuff. Or no, no family. She's the only, she was by herself. Yeah. She's so, the only family she yeah, had. Yeah. So that's interesting. And uh, actually, she came to the States. I brought her home for Christmas one year. So your family got to so, know her. Yeah. So everybody loved her and knew her. And, um, you know, she was like my Japanese mom. Really. Yeah. 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 So, um, that's neat. but, you know, I had worked for her and we were doing exhibits till she was about 70. So mm -hmm. just about nine years ago, 19 years ago, she kind of slowed down. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was like basically her chauffeur. I would take, take, take care of her dogs and take her shopping. And I'm like, you know, I didn't really, this wasn't my goal of being in Japan. Mm -hmm. So I had been doing photography more on, as a side thing. Mm -hmm. And that's when I decided to um, start my own company. And so I've been, you know, sponsoring myself the last, um, I guess, eight years. What's the, can you say the name of your company? You oh, it's just Mans. It's it's it, Mans Pro. So Mans, Mans Pro. Pro. Mans Pro. But um, you know, my main thing is photography. But I do translation, and um, you know, sometimes I do things on TV. Um, yeah, I know. I've seen that too. Right. Yeah. So you know, there's a lot so of. So you have a little modeling agency you go to. Yeah. Do, is, is there one in particular that you use all the time? No, no, no. So um, you do, I, yeah, freelance. freelance. Yeah. You're freelance. Yeah. No, freelance. No, freelance. <laughs> freelance. <You're> freelance. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But you know, the last few years I've been doing mostly studio photography. Okay. So I contracted with a Japanese studio. So you know, before that I was doing parties and entertainment, movies, and uh, concerts, and, you know, so I've done everything, fashion, I've done, you know, the entertainment, I've done parties. Which do you enjoy the most? Oh, gosh. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of embarrassing, but I really like uh, nature photography. 
So, <laughs> <laughs> and you're shooting people all the time. You'd rather be out in the woods. Huh? In the woods, or really? you know, and I love um, fireworks. Uh, I'm I'm working on an exhibit coming up, and it's gonna be mostly fireworks. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did an exhibit of my firework photography in Thailand mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's really what I love. But you know, the the kind of shooting people and stuff is what pays the bills. Right. What do you shoot with? What do you uh, use? Canon. Canon. Yeah, fire kind of uh, Um, I have right now. I just have a regular. Uh, it's uh, twenty-four to, to seventy. Yeah. Okay, you don't need much. They, I've heard before that if you're a good photographer, it's not the equipment. It's your eye. Yeah, your yeah. eyes matter, right. but... You can make a small camera look like it's yeah. taking by a pro if you're really good. But also, m more so than the camera, the lens is what's the most important. Yeah, yeah. Having right. a, a really good glass. Some, right, yeah. the, the proper amount yeah. of light and everything. But um, the, the, all the cameras right now are, are, are comparable. And mm -hmm. even, like, um, you can shoot really good photos with your iPhone. I know now. that. Yeah. I know that. I mean, and now everybody thinks they're a photographer just because the, you know. The, the ca camera's capable. Right? Yeah. But, um, you know, it's, it's been interesting. You know, I've shot everything from, um, you know, uh, prime ministers to, to royalty to, you know, to just regular people. Okay. Um, what would you say, give me your top three or top five shots you've taken that you think now, this is, I mean, this is the one. Um, so I was shooting this um, music um, event in um, Odaiba. And as we were leaving, we were looking at the sky and we we're like, man, this looks like really ominous. And this huge just front came in. It's like a black cloud over Tokyo. And in the distance, there was kind of light and it was towards Sky Tree. And we were crossing uh, Rainbow Bridge and I, and I looked up and I saw it and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. So I had, that time I had a telephoto lens, so 70 to 200 and it was packed away. And I tried to take a photo with my, my cell phone and it wasn't working. So I, I put my camera back together. And right when I took it out, we were near Hinode Station mm -hmm. on the highway and it just opened up. So I got, I rolled down the window and I, and I took a shot and I got this perfect kind of futuristic Tokyo scape with this crazy dark cloud over Tokyo. And that was, you know, just being at the right place at the right that's time. That's your favorite picture? Yeah, that's one of my okay. favorite photos. Give me another one. Um, another one, uh, it's not the best photo because it's actually not perfectly focused, but I was in uh, Rikugu Inn. It's a little garden um, inside Tokyo that's real beautiful. The, um, the fall fo foliage is, is amazing. And the first time I went there, there was like this little narrow brook and this, this leaf was like just floating down the brook and I just happened to catch it and it looks like it was frozen in time and that's my favorite photo although it's not my best photo but it's, it's still my favorite it's nice, um, it's nice, it's nice. and I've got some pretty good photos of Japanese fireworks but it's not me it's the fireworks you know Jap Japan has the best fireworks in the nice world so, so yeah so yeah but so what do you see yourself doing from this point? You've been here for how many years again? 22 years. 22 years. Yes. What do you see yourself doing from this point? Do you plan on stay, making this a long term? Yes. Yes. I don't see myself leaving Japan. Um, you know, I think if you live here four or five years, you can kind of take it or leave it, and it's easy to leave. But once you've been here 10 plus years, it's, there's so many positives, um, and it's so easy to live here. Uh, especially if you can speak some Japanese and are interested in the culture and the people, I, I think it's hard to leave. Have you thought about changing your, your nationality? Uh, no, I haven't thought of that. Because okay. um, you know, a lot, there's quite a few people doing that now. Yeah, you know, I have a, a the, friend. The Japanese have made it easier, especially if you plan on staying here. Right. You've been here for a while. Right. I actually have a, a, a friend who's black and American, and he changed his nationality. Um, I think, do you know Henry? I know yeah, Henry, so, yes. yeah, so, um, yeah. I never really thought of that, um, but, um, you know, I, I definitely feel like I'm American, mm -hmm. but the longer I stay here, I, I, I feel like when I look at the news and things that are happening in America, I, I can't understand mm -hmm. a lot of what's happening, and it, to me, it doesn't seem like the country I grew up in, 
So um, mm. I definitely plan on, you know, um, planting roots here. So um, I'm actually writing a book on uh, Japanese ninja movies. So um, when I was a student here studying Japanese, I used to go to the antique markets. And one time I found a guy who had uh, posters and I was like, oh, do you have Shinobi no Mona, which is a famous um, 1960s ninja film? And he did. So I bought this poster and it was like, wow, you know, this is like the holy grail of ninja movies. Um, and after a while, I, you know, I just started going every, every Sunday he was there, I'd buy posters from him. So now I think I have probably 200 ninja movie posters. So one of the, probably the best collections in the world. And one day I said, you know, it'd be kind of interesting to find the actual movies. And so I started looking and back then it was VHS and there were just a few on DVD. But um, I started, you know, writing down all the movies I could find and buying all of them and watching them and, and writing kind of a synopsis of them. So uh, over the years, I've been able to find that they actually made more than 400 ninja movies in Japan. And the oldest one was 1913. You have that? I don't have it, okay. but I, I have records of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they've actually, Ninja Movies in Japan is actually over a hundred year history. And there were actually several Ninja Movie booms. The first being in the 19 teens, and then the 1920s and the 1930s. And then the next one, the big one was in the 1960s. So um, I've actually gone and spoken uh, at several, I spoke at the, uh, the National Film Center. So um, in uh, Kyobashi, there's a film center. So I, I gave a talk about ninja movies there and also in Iga, which is the area where ninja are originally from. Um, the Mie University, they have these symposiums they do. So I actually went and spoke about these movies. So I've been working on writing this book um, the last couple years. So that's one of my big projects I'm, I'm, okay, I'm working on. Okay, you're going to probably end up speaking here too. Attack. Yeah, that'd we be do cool. That. I'm going oh, to really? introduce oh, okay. you to the, um, to the person who can set it all up for you. Okay. Because he's the librarian and our historian, too. Oh, nice. nice. And he loves that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's fascinating because no Japanese, um, you know, I've met a lot of real famous researchers and none of them have researched this. And none have compiled, taken the time to compile, you know, all the ninja movies. So mm -hmm. this, there's a history that's just, you know, well, hidden. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, so it's just really fascinating. Isn't that something? Um, oh, I got a lot of thoughts right now. Yeah. That's fantastic. Okay, there's a question I like to ask everyone at the end now. Oh, wait, I got to do one thing. Oh, do, do, do some more things. So, yeah. you probably don't remember this, but we met years ago. Before Dan? Yeah, we met years okay. ago. So, um, when I was in college, there was a documentary about blacks in Japan. That was struggling with success. Yes. And, and that was um, Reggie, Reggie Life. Life. Reggie Life. Yeah. And my cousins are friends with his parents in Detroit. Okay. okay. And so they got me in touch with him. And so I had seen that and seen you in that documentary. And one time, I'm, I'm trying to think when it was. It might have been when I was living in Tochi, but I, I had come to Shibuya and I was walking um, near the crossing. And I saw you, and you had this um, you had this uh, trench coat on. Mm -hmm. So it was you know late fall, mm -hmm. early winter. And I said, my name is Mans, and, and you're Lands, and and that was the first time I met you. Really? And you know it it was really kind of um, inspirational to me because this is someone I, you know I had seen who's made it made a success in Japan and was in this documentary. So then to finally meet you there, it was, it was real fascinating. And we went to be across the no, It was near Ogazaka. there. Near there. Okay. Yeah. But, um, yeah, but I was like, wow, this, I, I, I know this guy. I've seen, I've seen him on, you know, this documentary. So that was the first time we met. Well, and I'll never forget that because, you know. Yeah. I, don't remember, I don't remember that, I guess, but I should. Yeah. I should. If you said your name was Matt, I don't see yeah. I've had that happen a couple of times. Really? When people have come to me here, I have one guy that saw me in Hito. I, won't, I don't know why I don't forget him, because he was ex-military, I think. Mm -hmm. And he said, young man, keep on doing what you're doing. And that was just out of the blue. That's all he had to say. All right. And I said, who are you? He said, it doesn't matter. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Huh. OK. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I, I will? <laughs> I guess I will. 
But you know, I think, especially back then, and being someone black who's interested in Japan, you didn't have role models, you didn't have a, a, a kind of blueprint of how to succeed. So to see that documentary and that talked about people doing various different things in Japan and, and then to actually get a chance to meet one of them, it was just really, it made my day. Yeah. Oh, that's good to hear, good to hear <laughs> Tell me, what do you consider a good life in Japan? Um, just being healthy and um, you know having friends around you and being able to see Mount Fuji. <laughs> Those are my three things. That sums it up. Thank yeah. you so much. All right. I want to thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. I want to thank all of you for watching this podcast. Remember, it's all on loan, so continue to reach for the stars because you're too blessed to be stressed. Mm -hmm.